Welcome. Our topic today is kidney stones. Remember that the kidneys are vital organs which filter the blood and produce urine. Urine is composed of water, urea, and excess ions. It leaves the kidney via the ureter and is stored in the bladder until it is eventually excreted. Because urine contains ions that can form salts, these salts can crystallize and form into what are referred to as stones or calci, which can then obstruct components of the urinary system. Urolithiasis is a term that refers to stones forming in the urinary tract. The word lith comes from Greek and means stone. A stone located in the kidney is known as nephrolithiasis or renal calculi. If the stone is located in other parts of the urinary tract, such as the ureter or bladder, then it's known as ureterolithiasis or systolithiasis. Primary types of stones that form from the most common to least common are calcium-containing stones, including calcium oxalate and calcium phosphate, magnesium ammonium phosphate, also called struvite or staghorn stones, uric acid, and finally cysteine and xanthine stones, which are quite uncommon. Calcium phosphate and struvite stones are more likely to form in basic urine while uric acid and cysteine stones are more likely to form in acidic urine. Calcium oxalate stones may form in either alkaline or acidic urine. Three major steps in the formation of kidney stones include nucleation, growth, and aggregation. Nucleation refers to ions such as calcium and oxalate coming together to form a solid crystal nidus, and this most often occurs in the collecting ducts. These crystals are dumped into the renal papillae where they grow in size. In the renal pelvis, the crystals will aggregate with one another to form larger crystals and stones. At this point, they may leave the renal pelvis and travel into the ureter. The ureters are three to four millimeters in diameter. If the stone is, for example, five millimeters, it won't easily pass down the ureter and will elicit the characteristic painful renal colic as it irritates the ureter, especially during intermittent ureter peristaltic movements. Renal colic is the pain associated with the ureter stone. There is a continuous pain, but excruciating waves of pain come on intermittently. As periodic peristaltic ureter contractions attempt to force the stone down the ureter. This colicky pain occurs in the lower back and flank region on the affected side and may radiate to the abdominal region and down to the groin area. Intense colicky pain is often associated with nausea and vomiting. In contrast, non-colicky pain is continuous and is typically not as intense and is associated with the stone being in the renal calyces or renal pelvis. Unlike colicky pain, non-colicky pain increases with movements, so patients attempt to remain very still. Non-colicky pain is similar to that associated with appendicitis, or pancreatitis. There are many risk factors for stone formation, including stone-forming constituents, such as calcium and oxalates. Taking calcium supplements or regularly using calcium-containing antacids increases the risk for calcium stones. Oxalates are found in spinach, Swiss chard, cocoa, pecans, peanuts, soy products, and other foods and increase the risk for calcium oxalate stone formation. Magnesium ammonium phosphate stones form more commonly in women, and especially in those with recurring UTIs. Certain bacteria use the enzyme urease to convert urea into ammonia, which is basic. The now more alkaline environment increasing, increases phosphate in the urine, which combines with ammonium and magnesium ions to form the stones. Urate stones form more commonly in those that have high plasma levels of uric acid or hyperuricemia. A drug used for gout called probenicid blocks urate reabsorption in the PCT and will decrease urate levels in the urine, which also increases the risk for urate stones. For this reason, it is especially important to drink lots of water while taking probenicid. Unlike other urinary stones, Urate stones are not visible on x-ray films. Cysteine stones are the least common type at less than 1% overall, but they do represent a significant cause for stones in children. 
Cysteine stones come about due to genetic disorders that result in decreased cysteine reabsorption in the PCT, which leads to cysteinuria. These higher concentrations of cysteine in the urine favors crystal formation. Those living in the kidney stone belt are at greater risk. This is thought to be due to the warmer weather, which brings on increased risk for dehydration. Furthermore, the southern diet on average has more oxalates than sodium. For example, sweet tea is consumed often and is high in both oxalates and sodium. For ureterolithiasis, tamsulosin, an alpha-1A antagonist, can be used to help dilate the ureter and help the stone pass. A strong NSAID like ketorolac or opioids such as hydromorphone or mor morphine may be used for the intense colicky pain. Anti-nausea drugs like ondansetron and promethazine may be used to treat nausea and vomiting. Shockwave lithotripsy is a non-surgical technique that may be used for removal of kidney stones. The patient is positioned in a water bath or lies on a cushion. It is painful, so it's generally done under anesthesia. SWL involves the use of shock waves, which are high frequency sound waves or ultrasound that is targeted at the stone, breaking it up. SWL is useful for stones smaller than 30 millimeters and is not used for cysteine stones. Ureteroscopy is ideal for medium-sized stones in the ureter. This procedure is also done under general anesthesia and involves inserting a flexible, steerable ureteroscope into the bladder and then up into the ureters. A laser or pneumatic device is then used to pulverize the stone under vision. Treatment for large stones often requires a surgical procedure known as percutaneous nephrolithotomy, where a small hole is made in the back to access the kidney. A camera is inserted through the hole and allows for a visualization of the stone, which is then pulverized using ultrasound, lasers, or a pneumatic device. Kidney stone patients should be encouraged to drink lots of fluids, especially water, to prevent supersaturation of the urine and stone formation. Patients should also limit excess stone-forming substances in the diet, such as calcium supplements and oxalate-containing foods. Patients should decrease non-dairy animal protein, sodium, sucrose, and fructose in the diet. Patients are encouraged to increase potassium and phytates in the diet to help prevent stones from reoccurring. ACV may be helpful, but most evidence is anecdotal. To help prevent calcium stones, the physician may prescribe a thiazide diuretic. Thiazide diuretics block sodium chloride symporters on the apical membrane of renal tubular cells in the DCT. This acts to further decrease intracellular sodium levels in the DCT cells and thus increase the driving force for sodium to move into the cell via sodium calcium antiporters on the basolateral membrane. This increased antiporter activity moves more calcium that enters the cell via apical TRPV5 channels out of the cell where it is then reabsorbed into the blood. Therefore, treatment with thiazide diuretics increases bone mineral density by increasing calcium reabsorption and decreasing calcium in the urine, lessening the risk for calcium stone reoccurrence. The image shown here also helps one understand how increased dietary sodium increases the risk for calcium stones. Three naturally occurring stone inhibitors, citrate, magnesium, and TAM horsefall mucoprotein, help prevent stone-forming substances from coming together. Low urinary citrate levels may be increased by supplementing with lemon or lime juice. This will increase urinary citrate levels without increasing oxalate levels. In summary, several types of kidney stones exist. Calcium containing are the most prevalent. Three major steps in stone formation include nucleation, growth, and aggregation. There are many risk factors for stone formation, including elevated calcium and oxalates in the urine. 
Pharmacologic treatment includes medications for pain and nausea and vomiting and meds which help the stone pass. Other treatments include shockwave lithotripsy, ureteroscopy, and percutaneous nephrolithotomy. There are lots of things you can do to help prevent a stone. Remember to drink lots of water. And note the mechanism by which thiazides can be used to decrease calcium in the urine. Please pause the video now and choose the correct answer to this question. If you answered F, you are correct. If you answer C, you are correct. Thanks for watching.